New York State Attorney General Letitia James is changing the state's policy on how local police departments release body camera footage. For member station WXXI, James Brown reports. James's decision comes as a result of the recent case of Daniel Prude. Prude was suffocated in Rochester Police custody in March, dying a few days later. James says that published emails show the city of Rochester used state procedures as a way to keep police body camera footage out of public view. She says her office will now move quickly to release such footage. So that the public no longer has to wait months and months before seeing videos in possession of law enforcement. James anticipates a decision from a grand jury on the Prude incident shortly. For NPR News, I'm James Brown in Rochester. On Wednesday, U.S. Senator Chuck Schumer said passing the trillion-dollar bill wasn't easy. He says it's not over yet. It's as if we uh, caught a pass, a nice long pass at midfield, but we still have 50 yards to go before we score a touchdown. To get it passed took compromise, and that meant a massive cut to the part of the bill aimed at projects like filling in Interloop North. The city of Rochester has been working on plans for that project for more than two years and say it could cost hundreds of millions of dollars. Disappointed advocates like Sean Dunwoody of the group Hinge Neighbors have been working on it too. He says less funding means cities fighting for the same piece of the pie. But Dunwoody says he's still hopeful about the end result of the project. Won't help many of the communities, but you know, with meeting with Schumer's office and Joe Brand's office, they, they are they are adhering to their their commitment to help. Uh, Rochester in the interlude. Schumer spokesperson Allison Bassati wrote via email that they'll continue to push for funding. James Brown, WXXI News. Hello and welcome to Five Things. It's November 27th, 2022. Go Bills. Every week we take a question, an idea, or concept and go deep. In this week... We start on a mountain in Colorado. That's where I came from. I started out somewhere way down there. And here's the trail. That's Jason Colo. He's from Cleveland. Jason and his regular climbing companion, Oliver the Border Collie, are climbing down Mount Massive. You're ready to go, huh? All right, go on. <clears throat> He's a landscaper and a lifelong hiker. His Twitter biography ends with living outside, always. We'll hear more from Jason in a bit. If you search 14ers or mountains above 14,000 feet, on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter, you'll find thousands of videos like Jason's. Six people have died doing this. Died climbing 14ers in Colorado. Yeah. You're aware of this? Oh, yes. Yes, I'm aware of it. Um, It doesn't, I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't bother me. I don't want to die. But I know if I slip or fall or get hurt, there's a very good chance you could die, especially because I go in, in Colorado. I go alone with my dog and there's it's just me and him. And I have my GPS and I have my National Geographic maps. And, you know, if you're at the top, you get cell phone service. But when you're down in the thick of it, you don't there's just nothing. It's you have no service. There's no, you know, GPS. There's there's really nothing when you're in the woods heading up. If you think of a city of 300,000 and only six people dying, it's not, that would be a very, very safe place. Right. But in a city or in a community of 300,000, those folks who are dying aren't putting themselves in peril. <laughs> I would argue. Yeah, but I don't, I don't, right. I agree. I don't, I, I mean, you are putting yourself in a sticky situation. I mean, but I don't, you never, you go prepared, but you never think like, you know, you always think today's going to be a good day, I guess. You never think today is the day where oh, I'm going to get hurt or I'm going to fall or a big rock's going to land on my head or, 
you know, you just, you don't go with that mindset. Mary Louise Kelly, welcome to the program. Thank you, James. So happy to be with you. Another very interesting moment from your book. I've never been catcalled. I'm a total novice at it. <laughs> There's still time, what? James. <laughs> <laughs> ah, maybe it'll happen today. What's the experience like? When you're 20 something women, men turn and look and they wolf whistle you. And if you had told my 20 something self that I would miss that and admit it publicly, she would have told you I'd gone bananas. Um, I think what I was trying to write about and wrestle with was how surprised I have been by how very invisible a woman of 50 can suddenly feel. Will Shorts, welcome to Five Things. Thank you, James. Good to be here. How do you feel about the term puzzle master? Well, it's a nice term. It was uh, given to me by Leanne Hansen, who was a longtime host of Weekend Edition Sunday on NPR. And it's interesting. The epithet used to be if somebody who was good in puzzles was the puzzle king or maybe the puzzle queen. Uh, she called me puzzle master. And now everyone calls themselves a puzzle master. When did your parents realize that it was a real career? My mother was a writer. And so she was always supportive. She was a creative person. And uh, she, in fact, she was the one who showed me how to submit my puzzle manuscripts to publishers when I was a teenager. So I was very lucky to have my mother because I don't think most mothers would even know how to do that. My father was a personnel director for R. R. Donnelly Printing Company, more of a corporate type. And for years and years, he always, he always said, puzzles are an avocation, not a vocation. So he thought this would make a nice hobby to be a lawyer or whatever ever else I wanted to do. But once I started the New York Times in 1993, he came around and said, okay, I got the sense that he was accepting me by that point. WXXI's James Brown is joining us now. He is at School 45 on Clifford Avenue. And uh, James, what's going on there? What are you seeing now? Oh, the, street went, the streets went from empty to packed. Uh, we're seeing buses lining up dropping off students, uh, parents walking students to the door. It, it's been really, really busy over the last 15 to 20 minutes or so. I spoke with a couple of parents who were like, they, they were rushing their kids to the door. They were really happy to uh, get their kids in classrooms this year. Well, I know you spoke to uh, School 45 principal Rob Snyder earlier about uh what school will look like this year? As I alluded to, some restrictions are still in place, obviously, to, to try to contain the spread of COVID-19. What will that mean? Absolutely, Beth. Uh, he explained that things definitely won't be exactly as they were, but he wants it to get closer to normal. He says that uh, he's optimistic that things will be a bit easier for students and teachers despite some of the new rules that are in place. So we want to make school feel um, as, uh, you know, quote, normal as possible for them. We want it to go back to the way it was before. Uh, the cafeteria looks a little different. The ways we eat breakfast is going to feel a little different. But overall, we're going to put our masks on and we're going to hunker down and collaborate in the classrooms and get back to work. Yeah, I, I spoke with uh, an older student, a high schooler. She felt like she wasn't able to interact with her other classmates the way she could have prior in prior years how do you foster that in social distance it seems like there could be difficulties there yeah certainly um i think wearing masks right we recognize that wearing a mask is a major safety protocol that allows our students to i think interact more a young man's experience with the healing power of deep nature led to a multi-million dollar project that just might be the first of its kind WXXI's James Brown has the story. Deep in Letchworth State Park, Catherine Abita and her son Ali sit on a bench in a leafy green pine tree lined oasis. What do you like about this trail? Do you like the rocks, the trees, the benches? The trees. The trees? He and his mom live in Albany, and it takes them about four hours to drive to Letchworth. They came to see the soon to open Autism Nature Trail also known as the ant. After watching her son enjoy himself in the company of strangers, calmly looking at the trees and up at the sky, Abita says she once thought this kind of moment was impossible. 
I always was so hopeless before this project started, thinking that he was never going to really be able to do much with the world. But Abita didn't give up. She had an idea. When Ali was seven, she brought him to the Gibsonville Trail in Letchworth and walked with him along the stream. Abita says Ali immediately took to the area. Started throwing rocks and was giggling and laughing. It was the first time I'd seen him happy the whole trip out here. This experience set off a chain of events that no one expected. Abita told her mom, Pat, about the afternoon. Pat told a neighbor, Lauren Penman. I'm a retired educator. Penman was so moved by it, she told another neighbor, Susan Hernstein. Hernstein's response surprised Penman. She put down what she was doing and she said, isn't that interesting? I have a grandson with autism who lives in New York City, who loves to come and visit me because I take him to Letchworth State Park. That was the click that said there's something here. Those conversations led Penman and Hernstein down a rabbit hole of research, eventually leading them to Temple Grandin, a famed scientist who has autism. It was Grandin's advice that helped them make a key decision, the location of the trail. She explained that we needed to be in deep nature and, not re and, and resist the people who wanted us to build it closer to populations. Over the next seven years, Penman, Hernstein, and local advocate Gail Cerventi raised more than $3 million and secured a partnership with New York State. Today, they're known as the Ant Aunts. Penman spends several days a week overseeing every element of the construction of the trail. While other entities are making public places accessible, we are making an accessible place public. The trail is beyond compliant with the Americans with Disabilities Act. Everything, from the type of stone laid on the steps to the engineered wood fiber that lines the pass, to the repeated patterns of three throughout the park, was handpicked with neurodiversity in mind. But all will be welcome here when it opens in the fall. Abita couldn't be prouder of Ali's impact on this corner of the world. And think of all the lives that his story is going to affect. And I, I just feel really proud of, you know, the fact that his, his story inspired something that's wonderful. James Brown, WXXI News.